testing. Okay. We're going to call the meeting to order a little late at 5.37 p.m. Um, this is the agenda for June 9th, 2020. And we're on Spectrum Channel 27. And if someone would like to lead us in the pledge. Mr. Manning, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Would you like to listen, uh, sorry, would you like to lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That's a little hard to hear with the partitions. So we called the meeting to order. We have our pledge and roll call. President David here. President, or sorry, Trustee Hankin. Yeah, here. Thank you, and it's nice to hear you by phone. Trustee Hankin, or sorry, Trustee Manning. Yeah. Trustee Morris. And we're waiting for her attendance. Do we need to excuse her if she's not here yet? Um, not unless we, uh, technically, uh, trustees are not excused unless they they call in before. Okay, and we have quorum, so. Um, Trustee Rutowski Hines. Yeah. Great to see you. All Thank right. You. Great so to we have quorum. Cool. President, if I may, uh, as, as a matter of record, I'd like to report that during the last meeting in uh, May, that Trustee Rutowski Hines did send me a message. I did not see it until after the meeting. Mm. So she. She did have a family emergency that she was in the middle of, so I just wanted that to be reflected, at least in the minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. And we didn't do a whole lot last meeting as far as making big decisions because of we're deciding to give everyone grace despite the, the COVID challenges. Um, item number four on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from March 10th, 2020. I got a tough question. We actually have two sets of minutes to approve. We have March and April. So we'll start with March. I'm looking at the wrong side. My side. Okay. That's right, because last week, sorry, last month, we approved two months of minutes because we missed the first month due to the quarantine. Sorry. Time, time runs together with this quarantine. <laughs> All right, so approval of the minutes from May 12th, 2020. Forgive me. I move to approve the minutes from May 12th. Thank you. Uh, are we approving the minutes here? All right. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 And the motion carries with three out of three votes. Item number five is public comments on agenda items. Do we have our, um, sorry, I forgot Alan. I apologize, Alan. <laughs> this is so I, I, new for yeah. me. <laughs> I, 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 I apologize. I'm going to slow down a little bit and make sure that I remember that this is digital and in person. Thank you. So the motion carries with four out of four votes. We have four out of our five members. Thank you. So we have approved the minutes from May 12th, 2020. Item number five, public comments on agenda items. Do we have any public comments that were submitted online? That would be a Grace question. Grace. Grace is on the phone. Hi, Grace. Hello. We don't have any public comments on the agenda or from the floor. Okay. Oh, not even from the floor. Okay. So that would include our friends of the library? Actually, I, I have something from the friends. All right. So... Our library director will speak on behalf of the friends. And I printed. Some Thank you. I printed her email because she wanted to express that she misses you all. And then the second page is. Would you like me to read it aloud for the public? The public not being able to attend, is that also a pleasure? 
wall meetings, including city council meetings? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam President, that might be a good idea. All right, I'll read it out loud for the transparency for anyone watching. Um, the Friends of the Palmdale City Library say they're excited to move forward. During these exciting time and difficult times, the Friends have been fairly quiet. Our board members have been staying home and staying healthy, patiently waiting for the opportunity to do what we do best, move books. It seems the time is near and we're busy trying to figure out what phases of our new normal will be. Our virtual book sale, it's with excitement that we share the news that the Friends will hold their first virtual book sale on June 15th. The sale will take place at our new Facebook group, Virtual Book Sale Kiosk, that was set up for this purpose. If things go well, fingers crossed, we'll continue to hold them on a regular basis. With, in regards to the summer reading program, through our partnership with the Palmdale Women's Club, they choose to spotlight the summer reading program in their new community conversation project, this entailed a Facebook live chat with library staff, which aired yesterday and is viewable on their Facebook page. Please check it out. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, if I may. Uh, two, two things. Regarding the virtual book sale, having attended their last, the Friends' last board meeting, I can tell you, give you a few more details. Um, President Victory and their board, as she touches on here, is creating a way for... The, I haven't seen it in action, but they're taking pictures of books that will be available for sale. All of the purchases will be online, so there'll be no handling of cash. The, uh, so all the transactions will be handled online. Through and PayPal? then, I'm sorry? Through PayPal? I, I don't know if it's PayPal or some other means. But How do you pay? You assume by credit card of some sort. It'll be something like that on, online. I, I don't know exactly how, how they're doing it. <clears throat> and then uh, com communicating with us in the city, they will actually provide will provide space in front of the library for patrons to come pick up the books with social distancing guidelines in place. So the books will already be paid for. The idea is that on Friday of that week is when patrons can come by appointment to pick up the books that they have purchased. So I wanted, wanted to explain that. Can I ask you a, a question about about that? Um, yeah. Well, actually, let me wrap it up because you're probably going to answer the question, and then I'll ask you if I still have it at the end. Well, that's all I was going to say about the okay. virtual book sale. Okay. Um, I appreciate that you're having people make appointments. I'm just wondering what are your appointment uh, requirements for the virtual book sale? You know, as as far as the book sale, I, I don't know their their details. Um, um, I'm talking more about the pickup when okay. when they're picking up. I'm sorry. Yes. Let me clarify. Okay. And on that, if I may, I'll wait until I get to my report. Um, okay. Because I will be talking about some of those details. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sorry I regarding the summer reading program uh, promotion that the friends helped to facilitate with the Palmdale Women's Club that. Live, the Facebook live chat happened this uh, yesterday, on Monday, yesterday, and we appreciate the friends and the Palmdale Women's Club hosting that, facilitating that. It was a Zoom meeting that was fed live over Facebook. It involved myself, Jamie Lee Beck, the assistant director, and Jackie Seacamp, the youth services librarian, in my office where we talked about the summer reading program. So we really appreciate their help and efforts in, in hosting that. Okay. Um, the only other thing that the friends want to share is upcoming news. There are tentative plans to hold a bag sale in August. They're still in the planning phase, learning about the various stages of reopening, along with the associated guidelines. And as more details are confirmed, they will share. Of course, everything is up in the air. <laughs> Any uh, comments from the floor? All right. So we have co public comments from the friends. Thank you, Tina, um, for those comments from the friends. We appreciate the work you guys do, even online. Item number seven, there's resolution LB 2020-06, a, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees of the City of Palmdale, California, 
ratifying and approving the Palmdale City Library check register for checks dated May 16th, 2020, totaling $487.47. Is there a motion? Well, this is Alan Hinken. I move to adopt resolution LB 2020-06. Uh, Thank you, Trustee Hinken. Second. Thank you, Trustee Rutowski hines And that is a roll call vote. So, Trustee Hinken. Aye. Trustee Manning. Aye. Trustee Rutowski hines Aye. And Trustee David. Aye. The motion carries with four out of four. And the motion passes. Resolution LB 2020-07, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees of the Library City of Palmdale, California, approving and adopting a budget for the fiscal year 2020-2021. That budget is included in your notes in your folder. Good evening, board. Um, did, you, did everyone receive the revised version of the budget with this, with this memo and the revised version? I did not receive that in the mail. Did you guys receive it in the mail? Not in the mail. It's there on your table. On your, on your table. Yeah, I have it on my table, but I didn't receive it in the mail beforehand, so I just wanted a quick second to look it over. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was, yeah, that, that's what I was asking. We've had mailbox break-ins, and they've sent everything to the annex. Is there anything different? I know that there's been fiscal um, cutbacks across the board from the state. Is that affecting it, the library? It's a very... There is no effect um, on this budget it's a very minor um, change it's literally one light item dropping down lower in the budget to a different category okay and what light item is that so the the last um, the transfers out at the bottom uh -huh. the seventy six thousand oh seven zero it move it it's now a our information technology our IT team is now being brought in-house so mm -hmm. it just moved from contract services down to that line item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's actually impressive considering the budget cuts that have been happening across the state. Is there any discussion on that before we... I had a couple questions. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? That's what I'm here for, to answer any questions. On the salaries, is, I assume that's 4000 not four million. There's no three zeros. What is that salary... That the uh, city of Palmdale pays to the library for part-time salaries. Um, it's part -time for part-time and full-time. Uh, full-time, our salaries um, from any part-time employees like myself or our director, a portion of our salary is allocated to the library for to support okay. uh, the contract of the library, and then for part-time salaries, it's for the public security officers that work at the library, providing security for okay. the services there. And then to go down further, there's. Library services eight hundred and seventy thousand. LSNS. What is LSNS? So that's library systems and services. This is the contracted amount that the city pays LSNS okay. to facilitate and run the library. Okay. So each year there's a negotiated amount, and each year it goes out up by a percentage. So you'll see a difference between what's projected in nineteen twenty and a little increase in twenty twenty one for next year. Library services. Negotiates with the city of Palmdale. It's already pre-negotiated. It's already in a contract over the next 10 years. And it has cost of living increases, things of that sort? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's pretty standard. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And then further on, is that supplies LSSA library material? What is that? Same thing. There's a pre-negotiated amount or a allotment that LSNS can utilize to purchase books, materials, um, e-books, uh, databases, so they purchase them on behalf of the city, and the city reimburses LSNS as part of the contract okay. for those items. Okay, I'm happy. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments on the budget? I'm sure. right. I, I would like to. Please. Um, in terms of revenue, use of property, what is that? Is that um, overdue fines? Give me one second, please. Yes, so the the category is kind of a use of property um, category. It's a rent, so yes, and then you can see under the object account description, library use fee, it's it's fines yeah. and fee. It's fines and fees, yes. That's what's been collected year to date, um, about $13,000. 
I don't think we're projected to make any more revenue this year on that item because we're not collecting fines and fees as because of COVID. And the estimated amount for next year is about $30,000. And you can see the first two line, the first two lines, their actuals for 1718 and 1819, what the revenue from that particular line item was. Yeah, so very, very interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's approved for 2021's budget. Um, that would mean that anyone who owes fees for 2021 would be due to pay them. And I know that in the past we've been discussing whether or not we're going to um, in-state library fees, mm -hmm. late fees. Mm -hmm. So if, like, let's just say potentially we passed, a, um, we passed a motion to get rid of late fees, not necessarily fees to cover um, damaged books or late books, mm -hmm. but, like, just late fees... Um, would that would that retroactively affect people who've already been approved under elite fees, or would that be going forward? I believe that would be a decision that the board would, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, on the direction, but I believe that that would be kind of up to the board to make a, make a recommendation in terms of how they would handle existing late fees. And then that rec as part of that recommendation, we would then bring it to the city council for final approval. Thank you. So if there's anything outstanding and you want to recommend washing that clean, that would be a decision that the board could make and a recommendation they could make. On the current resolution? On, or retroactively? Well, any, anything, and Robert, maybe jump in here. I don't, anything, I think I've heard you say, and anything that's currently on the books, if you want to excuse that, that could be part of your recommendation. What is the board's um, feelings on that, given the current discussion around? Um, if, if I may, and, and, yeah, yeah, please. Go ahead, go please. ahead, Robert. Yes, and I think um, they've currently been been. It's been hold, an item right? of discussion. I know it's been belabored because of the, mm -hmm. the COVID crisis. Of course. Of course. Uh, if I follow your question correctly, so as far as the situation we're in right now with COVID nineteen, uh, any late fees that would have been charged. Or will not be happening since mo the middle of March. Right now, it's up until July first. Okay, so from March to July, July first, any late fees do not count due to the COVID crisis. And basically, no late fees are being charged. So these are pre-existing late fees. Yes. Got it. So th that's your question. Yes, yeah. I wanted to know, like in the in the in the circumstance that, like, let's say in the next three months, the board decides to let's say, and this is not speaking for the board. Let's say the board decides to excuse late fees, we're going to get rid of them, would that retroactively affect the people who owe fees from before March? Yes. Okay. And the only other thing I would add is that <clears throat> at, when we get, when we, um, as we prepare for that in-depth discussion that we'll mm -hmm. be having at some point, I see our role as library staff and LSNS and, and the city, that'll be part of the, um, we will do our best to, to present to the board all of as many <laughs> caveats and nuances and potential consequences <laughs> of, of that decision that will include details like that. Okay. You know, how far back do we go? Uh, when does it take effect? What does that mean to the city? All, all those things will be part of the overall discussion. Thank you. I bring that up not because I'm putting pressure on the board um, or the library staff. I just want to bring it up considering the fact that we've had discussions about library fines. And I want to make sure that whatever we're voting on um, is taking that into mind. And on the, the subject of fines, because we have had this discussion. Yes. Um, and I don't expect you to have this today, mm -hmm. obviously, but um, as we deliberate this issue, knowing the percentage of these fines, which are late fees and which are because of damaged books, you know, the breakdown, I'm sure you guys are going to do that anyway, but I think that'd be really important to have that data to make that decision intelligently. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So considering the information we just had, um, we do need to make a vote on that. Resolution of the Board of Library Trustees of the City of Palmdale, California, approving and adopting a budget for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, that is a roll call vote. Are you guys ready to vote? 
Or is there more discussion? I'll second it. Trustee Hankin, do you have any um, any other additional comments? Comments? I do not. I'm ready to vote. All right. Trustee Hankin. Aye. Trustee Manning. Aye. Trustee Rutowski Hines. Aye. And Trustee David Aye. So the motion carries with four out of four. And the director's report, item number nine on the agenda. Uh, all right, I have some uh, lengthy notes <laughs> that I'm going to refer to. We would expect that during the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Not changing. And hopefully you can hear me okay through this facial covering. Um, first of all, I want to express sincere thanks under these conditions. Uh, Renee from IT, who helped set this up. I want to thank Armin behind the scenes, who is providing the technical support for the broadcasting. I want to express thanks to Grace, who helped us prepare so we can have this meeting. Erin, filling in on site. Thank you, Grace and Erin. Thank you, Grace. Yep. Uh, I want to thank Eric for being here from the city. And I want to thank each of you uh, for being a board member, and especially at times like this, to come out and, and participate on the phone to be a part of this meeting. <clears throat> Please note, this is kind of an aside, but I thought of it. In fact, I wrote it <laughs> in a margin here. Regarding next month's meeting, we, we know that the date is going to be changed. So we will let you know what date is going to be. The reason for that is we know that the city council will be meeting on the second Tuesday in July. Mm -hmm. Because of Independence Day, they will move their meeting from the first week to the second. That, that happens each year, but in the past, we just met in the administrative conference room over in City Hall. Well, now that we've graduated to City Council Chambers using this online ability and broadcasting ability, we really need to meet in this room, and so I need to work on scheduling with the city when we can have the meeting. I will be proposing the second Wednesday of July, but you will receive a confirmation once we know when that'll be happening. So just to clarify, we would move from the second Tuesday of every month to the second Wednesday. Oh, only for only July. Only for July. Yeah. Which would make that July 8th, correct? I actually haven't looked. Okay. <laughs> I just know it's the second Wednesday. Though, I, believe that's the, I believe that's the 8th. Okay. Okay. Again, uh, you can pencil that in, but, but don't write it in ink yet because... Uh, we need to get that confirmed, working with the city clerk, actually. Thank you. Okay, now on to my, uh, my repaired notes. I wanted to do this last month and I forgot. I want to recognize trustee and board president Kaylin David for her Teacher of the Year award that she received. If you didn't hear about that, <laughs> <laughs> she received a Teacher of the Year award. Teacher of the Year for... For my school district, for my site. Not for the whole district. Good yeah. for you. Not for the whole district, for the site. A teacher who's been teaching 52 years got it for the district, and that is very well deserved. 52 years, wow. 52 years, I, I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> but I am excited to represent my site. Your time will come. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> only in about 40 more years. <laughs> so congratulations, and, yes. and that, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Good Thank job. you. And furthermore, I want to congratulate uh, President David on her reappointment to the library board back in April. Uh, I, I didn't realize I was on the agenda until I, Time I saw it happening. Time having fun. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, she was reappointed by the city council um, back in April for another three-year term. <clears throat> All right. Status report. I'll be referring to my notes and reading some of them, so... I apologize for that. Um, regarding the library reopening and the services that we continue to provide, the readers, the uh, phone reference and phone readers advisory, we've been doing that and we continue to offer that. Um, now, Trustee Rutkowski Hines, what was your question again about that you just? That you just asked. What was I totally lost it at this. I I've totally lost it at this point. I think it had, it was the procedures we're following. I think. Oh yes. oh oh yes. I was wondering, um, just like <clears throat> when you make the appointments. So yes. Like how many people are there in that appointment period? I'm That's just right. kind of okay. about the numbers. Thank you. So the uh, the details of how we're handling that is that they can come and pick up 
Okay, when they call on the phone or if they place a hold online for an item in our collection, we talk to them over the phone and we make an appointment on the phone for them to come. We set those appointments up 15 minutes apart. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that only one person comes at a time uh, for those appointments. We, <clears throat> library staff will confirm that their card is in good standing and then go ahead and check the items out right at that moment. So when they come to the door, they, we don't even have to see the card. We don't have to handle the card. They, we ask for the last four digits of their library card number to confirm that's who they are. We have prepared, we, we got uh, paper bags that the items are placed in and we set that bag on a table that's outside of the front entrance. So there's no uh, physical contact. There's the table that's a barrier to provide for social distancing. And then the patron can just grab the bag and, and go. So that's how we're handling the social distancing guidelines that we've received. Sounds great, thank you. Okay. So we continue to offer that. <clears throat> uh, as was mentioned, the due dates have now been extended to July 1st. And our intent is that we will continue to extend due dates until we're, we can reopen to walk-in services. Um, for your information, we had locked the book drops so that people could not, could not even, they didn't have the choice to return items. We did that back in March. We have now unlocked the book drops and we have instituted uh, procedures with staff to, when they unload the book drops that are outside of the building, staff wear gloves when they, and facial coverings when they get the items out of the book drops take them into the activity room, which we now call our quarantine room. The we, room? We, quarantine room. Quarantine room. <laughs> it's a new world. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, these are the guidelines that we have received, and, and we need to follow them otherwise. Uh, we, we, don't want, we don't want the city or us to get in trouble with the county, so that's what we're doing. I will say that the library has been incredibly transparent about that. I've yes. seen that on social media advertised, mm -hmm. um, what the guidelines are and what the procedures are. Yes. And um, thank you for sharing via email that the Hoopla services are in, are in action. I don't know if you're going to share about that in your report. Yeah. Okay, I'll yeah. wait for that yeah. then. Okay. Thank you. Um, so regarding the quarantine room, we place items in there for overnight, and then the next day staff are uh, wiping them down with disinfectant spray or, or wipes, and then we reshelve the items. So that's how we're handling the return of materials right now. And that is our plan. It's, it's our plan to do it that way when we reopen to walk-in services. So our hope is that <clears throat> we will be able to reopen to, for walk-in services at that point, our plan is that it will only be for checking out items that in the physical collection. As I think I mentioned last month, uh, there will not be computer access to begin with. The furniture has been moved out of the library so that patrons will not be able to stay as far as sit and, and stay. The, uh, there will be a maximum occupancy in the building <clears throat> and um, and folks will be encouraged to come in, get their materials. Uh, Can check. I ask a question about the max occupancy? Yes. What is that number based on, and how will you regulate it? Our plan is, now some of these details will be finalized when we actually get an, an, an open date, but our plan is that, that a staff member will be at the door to, um, to talk with, with patrons and to... Uh, enforce the facial covering requirement that the county has given. Mm -hmm. That for ages three and up or five and up. The guidelines that I've seen is two and under. They do not need to wear. In fact, they should not wear a facial covering. Got it. But any age above that, they will need to wear a facial covering. So just to clarify, two and up will be required to wear a facial covering to enter the library. Those are the guidelines that I've seen, and that's what we would follow. That's what I've seen also, so I just want yeah. to clarify. Yes. Yeah. As far as the number, uh, maximum occupancy, the number that we've come up with is a maximum of 50 in the building at a time, 
and that was based on a a thorough walkabout in the building but with me and the assistant director Jamie Lee to come up with our best our best uh, educated guess as to how many people could be in here and you you could still have social distancing going on mm -hmm. so that's what we've come up with for now you know offhand the square footage of the the building it's I just mean, it's just under thirteen thousand. thank you square feet however i mean i will just add that <clears throat> is that 60 percent occupancy or 50 percent uh, i do not know what the official occupancy is if there is one but frankly in my mind that's a moving target because it's a relative term and decision uh, because square footage is just square footage. Very standing. It doesn't take into account how many rows of shelving do you have, how many tables and chairs do you have. And so that's why we came up with that number of, uh, of 50 based on our on the ground experience and best guess of okay, if. If this space is filled up with people checking out items. I think what um, maybe I'm wondering if I'm, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what I'm wondering is social distancing guidelines. So like let's say that two, two or three parents are in line with their children and they all want to be in the children's section. And let's say three children are in the same aisle. Um, and obviously children have difficulty with <laughs> spacing. Rule and rules. <laughs> space in general. Yeah. They have zero concept of, <laughs> yeah. of space, especially yeah. personal space. Um, what is the library going to do if there are several parents in the children's section? Are we going to strictly <clears throat> enforce social distancing, or are we going to say if your mask is on and you're not touching each other, that's on you? Appreciate the question, and those are some of the very discussions that we've been having internally and, and with the city. I, I honestly, I think some of that remains to be seen, but our, our best plan right now, and per guidance we've received from the city, and Eric can quote me, uh -huh. or correct me if I'm misquoting anything, is that I, I see us monitoring at the door. When it comes to people in the building, I do not see us policing that. Uh -huh. Is that close? Yeah. I would so we're going to leave it up to the patrons to basically... Follow the guidelines, and if you don't, that that's a personal choice that the library is not responsible for. Uh, that that's our that's our that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. like, much like when you go into a grocery store, I don't know sure. if you've been into one. Everyone's kind of self policing, self monitoring. Mm -hmm. If there is some sort of conflict, if you will, I think that's when library staff, just like they would for any other conflict, would would jump in. But we're not going to be. We would we would really like library staff and, and parks and recreation staff not to be the social distancing police. police sure. So if Robert and I are in two different families, we would hope that we could just stay apart. And if my kid gets in his personal space, there's some, a little space, bit of a, sweetie. there's a little bit of understanding. Sure. So we'll see though, if that, if there is a conflict or something that arises, that's when their staff would jump in. But sure. we're not going to follow people around and make sure it's six feet apart, <laughs> six feet apart. You know, I think that would just be, there's it would some, make people feel unwelcome. Right. That, I mean, on a personal level, I don't want to speak for I, the board, but and I, I don't feel either. Like policing people would make people feel unwelcome, but on another, on another level, everyone has a different level of what they feel comfortable with. Some people are following very, very strictly Correct. the social distancing guidelines as far as we have not left our home, we are going to the library, we have not made contact with any other people, and there are people who have said we've opened our circle to immediate family and friends. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that... Um, Whatever we do is, yeah, that we know what we're doing. And then it's right. not random and it's not. Well, and we're going to have people violating it anyway just because it's going to be apparent with children who they're closer with at home. So yeah. it kind of like just extends that circle from where the last kid is. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're going to be grouped together as a family unit if they come in together as a family unit. When you start, because I'm doing the square footage calculations here. You can't play those numbers. You just gotta. And kids, kids. To be fair, kids are not going to be like, oh, six feet apart. Yeah. A question though on that is the library enacting any sort of visual representation of social guidelines? Is there are there markers on the floor? Are there any type of social distancing guidelines for checkout? Like much like a grocery store would have. There are not yet, but there will be. Okay. Um, 
we've talked with the city, and whenever we whenever we get the word that okay, we can now open, mm -hmm. we'll get that from the city. We'll get it from the county. Okay. Once we get that, then we've talked about we'll then we'll get together and really nail down this is how we're going to proceed, and uh, it'll be at least a couple days for us to prepare before we actually open. Sure. And so stay tuned. <laughs> it's going to be an adventure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Again, I ask that not out of condemnation, but out of um, thinking ahead. Yeah, thinking I appreciate ahead. it. And yeah. these are the exact kind of discussions that we've had internally at the library and that I've had with Eric and uh, Carrie I'm Smith. Um, I, I find your, your diffi most difficult is going to be trying to stay on that fine line between the two different sides of that. So yes. I commend you on both trying to take both sides into consideration and both viewpoints. Sure. Yeah. And it's clear that you've been doing we that. We want to welcome you. people, but we don't want to exclude people. Right. But exactly. we want to respect people's boundaries for mm -hmm. safety and health. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, want to set, I want to share some um, information. It's anecdotal in that it's not scientific data, but it is true data that I can share with you from some other libraries. So it's just a sample. And, and we, don't, we have no idea how many people will actually come. Mm -hmm. And uh, one LSNS library in Texas who opened about a month ago was on, on a recent Zoom meeting with all of the LSNS library directors across the country. And she shared that they're not busy. That they've been open for three or four weeks, at, I think three weeks at that point. And they said people just are not comfortable coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they still have a lot of people taking advantage of the appointment service, mm -hmm. and they love that. But as far as, as far as their experience, it's nowhere near normal as far as people you know, running to the library. So I have a question. Is the library setting up any sort of like online checkout system where patrons can say, I would, I would like to put this book on reserve. I'd like to check this book out. We put it on hold. They come by appointment. And they say, I'd like to check out these books on Wednesday. And they come up, they pick up their books, and they leave. And they don't actually enter the library premises besides the front table or the front desk. Uh, yes, what you just described is what we're, we're already doing. And we intend to continue that at, at least until, you know, groups can gather then that sort of thing. But we may well continue that service forever because it's a pretty yeah. popular service. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like takeout, you know, your yeah. favorite restaurant. I will also share just uh, no one knows when we'll be able to reopen. For your information, the State Library of California sent a document just today uh, that we received. <coughs> Eric uh, got it in his email. I, I had a chance to read through it. So from the state level, as of today, the state is saying public libraries can now open beginning the 12th, which mm -hmm. is this Friday. Mm -hmm. However, they quickly add <laughs> that your local city or county may have more strict guidelines. And we all know that we live under LA County's uh, health order. So we will not be opening July 12th, or I mean June 12th. <clears throat> But I want, wanted to share that. The, the document also has about 20 pages of guidelines, uh, all of which we are already following as far as the services that we do provide. Um, and for what it's worth, and, and yes, I am a little bit proud of this, I hats off to the city that they have supported us as, as a library. Uh, they continue to support us financially. They have been proactive in wanting to provide as many services as can be provided, and, and I appreciate that approach. We started our front door takeout service within about two days after we closed. There are a lot of libraries that are just starting that kind of service in other parts of the state. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I do know, just to give you an idea, uh, libraries that I am aware of, uh, Simi Valley Public Library, they are completely closed to the public right now, and they can only have four staff members in the building at a time, and that's only to process materials that are coming in, either new materials or return materials. 
That's how the city of Simi Valley has chosen to approach this. Um, <clears throat> Moore Park Library. To begin with, they closed their library and they actually furloughed all their employees. They now have the, the employees back and, and those employees are working in the building and they're talking about starting curbside. Uh, Camarillo, I, I know these libraries because they're LSNS libraries. In Camarillo, uh, that library furloughed everybody. They have about 30 member staff. They were furloughed immediately. And just to, just to clarify for anyone who's tuning in, we have agreed to pay our library staff without furlough through this, um, through this time period. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, in Camarillo, now uh, they do have eight staff members back in the building to, to uh, handle business that needs to go on uh, in, in the library. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm not sure where they're at on, on curbside. Yeah, uh, in Riverside County, uh, Riverside County is an LSNS library, and, and their county, um, last I heard, uh, no staff are allowed in any of the buildings. And so uh, that's interesting. And then I was in a, uh, in a Zoom meeting this last week <clears throat> that included the director of Glendale Public Library, uh, Glendora, and Pasadena. And uh, one library director, I'm mainly sharing this just to point out what you already know, but everybody has a different comfort level on, on this thing, mm -hmm. including library directors. And, and I respect them. They have their reasons. Mm -hmm. One of those library directors down below said, I have no interest in bringing anybody back to the building until further notice. <laughs> And, and so he's not talking about services. He's not even talking about staff coming back to the building yet. And then the other two libraries are starting to talk about curbside service in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so again, I, I, shared, I did learn just recently that uh, Shasta Libraries up in Redding, Northern California, that's an LSNS library. Uh, they're planning to reopen on June 22nd to, to walk in services. So I just share that as uh, kind of a feel for where, what some other libraries are doing. I have a question. Yes. Um, how is our library taking stock of what our own personal library employees are feeling comfortable with and what they would like? Because I know it, like, um, for example, I'm a district <coughs> employee, and our union sent out a survey of what would we be willing to come back under, what conditions are we willing to come back under, what protections and... Um, procedures are we willing to come back under and has the library done anything like that where we're asking our library service um, members and our and our employees what they feel comfortable with because they are enacting with the public yes yes they are and um, now we are all of course LSNS employees and and working under the direction of library systems and services uh, I, I won't go into details but I, I will tell you that uh, I feel like LSNS has been very sensitive to that Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I've, I've tried to be sensitive to that. I've had one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, in my office, social distancing, <laughs> um, and or on the phone to talk about those very questions and issues. And, and, and there's a variety of comfort levels. Uh, there's been staggered scheduling. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been allowed to take... Uh, a limited amount of time paid off or paid leave, um, administrative leave, but they're also allowed to use their sick vacation or take leave without pay without losing their jobs. Okay. For uh, how many days? Fourteen quarantine days or? Uh, right now, it's uh, it's been open ended. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Without a doctor's note. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, all of that has been suspended for now. I will say that I have received word, and, and I support this, that once we get the word that we can reopen to walk-in services, then that's when uh, all staff will be expected to return to work, unless, if they're not comfortable, they will be allowed to continue to use that leave, um, but there will be no more paid admin leave, for example. It'll, We'll have to use vacation sick or take leave without pay 
So but they will not but, perspective but issue. they will not lose their jobs. Okay, that's that's good. I like that they won't their jobs are not at risk. So let's say an employee has an underlying health issue and they feel like they are more at risk for COVID. That's different. Yes. So how what is the is there an HR agreement with that? Is there that'll be a what pers- kinds of employee protection? That'll be a personal discussion between them and HR. Okay. Does the rest of the board have any commentary on that? Okay. Okay. I did, wa- I did want to thank you though because I think part of the reason that you, you've been able to transition so easily into this is that our library does more than just library stuff. I mean, we, mm-hmm. under your leadership, it, it's kind of shifted a little bit to even social services with the, you know, all the stuff that you're doing with the uh, movies and, and all the things that go on at the library. So it's already set up to be a multifaceted organization. It's, it suits our city, you know, mm-hmm. that way. And um, I appreciate that. I appreciate all you've done, even during COVID. I mean, I'm looking at the pictures of the wrap on the, on the wrap <laughs> that was done. I mean, that is so awesome. So, I mean, you've been very proactive during this, getting stuff started. And I want to just thank you personally for that. So thank you. Agreed. I really, really appreciate, appreciate how they've thought about our employees and not just our constituents. Um, because our employees are the ones who serve our constituents. And I deeply appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. That was just my uh, second bullet. <laughs> but it's, it's all important. Uh, so summer reading program, as was already mentioned, uh, so it officially launched yesterday. The summer reading program, and it the, on the calendar it goes from yesterday until July 31st. Children, teens, and adults are encouraged to go online. We're tracking minutes minutes read online this year. Those that choose to participate can then, for, for the kids and teens, there are little badges that they can earn. Uh, and especially the kids love badges. And so as they read so many minutes, they can earn a badge. And when they earn so many badges, then they get entered into, uh, they can earn a higher level prize and get entered into drawings for a grand prize at the end. Like um, a pie smashing contest? Yeah, I'm going to come to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some of the other prizes, I, I can't remember all the prizes, although, so we are providing an option of an e gift card for all the ages. They can choose their prize. For the kids and the teens, we're still going to provide physical prizes that are fun and <laughs> pretty cute. If they, if they want to get those, then they can come pick those up by appointment. So we will prepare those in advance, and they can choose what kind of prize they want to get. I will tell you, I encourage you to participate as an adult member of our summer reading program for a couple of reasons. One is uh, some of the grand prizes for the adults include $50 gift cards to restaurants and stores here in town. So that, that can be worth reading and tracking some minutes. And I appreciate that, supporting local business after Absolutely. everything that's going on. Yep. Yeah. And then the, the other point that Madam President <laughs> brought up is a, um, there will be a special grand prize drawing added this year where in yours truly, uh, I have agreed to receive a pie in my face for, <laughs> for a lucky person that participates, and they enter a drawing, and if they get drawn, then they can put a pie in my face. I'm willing to do that to promote literacy and reading, and I'm very happy to say that after I went public with that, I now have a, <clears throat> have a distinguished list of uh, folks who are willing to join the Pie in the Face Library of Fame, as I'm calling it. <laughs> Without your enemies, I'm <laughs> Uh, the first person I asked, and he said, count me in, was John Milner. If you know John, he's the communications person for the city. He, he actually, don't tell the kids, but he also plays Santa Claus, uh, of course. He needs another pie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eric Nebrowski said, count me in. Good job. With a caveat. <laughs> don't forget it. <laughs> Fat-free, cool with. Something about a choice of pie, is that... I just want a piece of pie. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And we're going to deal with very calendars where we get the, the you know, cocoa whipped cream versus... Yeah, the, uh, the negotiations, are, negotiations are ongoing. Um, Carrie Smith agreed. Oh. So bless your heart. 
And then, um, by email, city manager J.J. Murphy has, has agreed. Oh, wow, great. And then earlier today, our very own Madam President, Caitlin David, has agreed <laughs> to receive so five people on board. <laughs> yes. I'm going to make a suggestion that our, a great way to get some people following us would be um, the boomerang feature on Instagram. Our city, um, our social media coordinator, who I believe is Jamie Lee still, right? Yeah. She, if she wants to do a boomerang of the pie going in the face. <laughs> that, that, I think that yeah. would get a lot of followers. Okay. You sure and get that in the minutes. I man. got it down. Okay. <laughs> it can go viral. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it, it's a worthy cause, and uh, that'll be fun. And and I like pie anyway. So well, I'm gonna I'm gonna gently invite you guys to join me in the pie smashing contest. I don't know if I can if I can do that at this time, but that's something that I have done before, and I just wanted to warn you that plastic bags will not protect you because <laughs> I have been in that before, and man, it goes down your neck. I will say as a teacher, <laughs> yes, I've done this with my students before, yeah. and they love nothing more yes. than shoving whipped cream down your face. Yes, <laughs> and really smashing it. So really, really digging it time. in. Yeah. yeah, I think it'll be great incentive, and I appreciate you guys um, just putting that out there. <laughs> Yes. Anything for the reading cause? Well, That's almost right. almost anything. All right. A little update regarding the summer lunch program. Mm. I've had several phone conversations now with my contact at Palmdale School District. Uh, we continue to talk that we will become a food distribution site when we open to walk-in services again. They are prepared to do that with us, they are. They, she told me the last time I talked to her that they have already prepared the meals and they're actually in a freezer uh, waiting for the time that they can include us as one of their meal distribution sites. That's great. So we will plan to do that. I've also started talking with her and I have a call in to a, a, a district administrator that she referred me to to see if we can <clears throat> So I'm going to work on this, but they already have 10 sites in the city where they distribute meals already, that they've been distributing emergency meals to the kids. She told me that they're distributing like 2,000 a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my idea is if we can, we will go there with the normal bill <laughs> and pre... Um, arranged or <laughs> prepared uh, bags of uh, activity and literacy kits that we could hand out to the kids as well. It, are those activity bags being prepared by library staff or volunteers? Um, uh, library, library staff. Library staff. Thank you. And we did receive some grant money. I just talked with uh, Tim today. Um, <clears throat> we got some grant money from the state library to hire two teenagers for the summer for the summer lunch program. And so we're going to start working on that process. Hopefully we'll get them in place by next week. Will those jobs be posted on the city website, through email? Are they closed? Uh, good question. I, due to the timeline, nature of the grant, we're going to tap into teams that the city has already hired. Sure. And then we will interview people who are interested in getting some extra hours working at the library. That's great. That's what we did last year for, well, for one teenager. If I could add. Yeah. It's, it's very possible those individuals that are that they're talking about are not currently working. Mm -hmm. They could be. Many of our programs are on hold right now, so these might be hours that they wouldn't otherwise have received or may not be getting paid at all right now. So no, and I, I think that's I think that's really important, and I'm glad that you guys are speaking on the library summer the, well, the summer reading program because I know that with schools being out now, um, feeding our feeding our kids is a really important part of what yes, school districts yes. are still doing. Yeah. And I know there are budget cuts deeply, yeah. considering the governor's budget, potentially 10%, potentially 5%. But even so, a lot of those cuts come first to things like extra programming. So I was really concerned about our summer lunch program and how that was going to affect it. Yeah. Great. So is that, that funding is secure then? It is for this year. Okay. It is in danger for next year. Thank you. Um, if we wanted to advocate for to keep that funding for next year, who would we appeal to? Uh, for the summer lunch program, as far as our part of it, that would be the governor's office because okay. the uh, the state library receives appropriations from the governor's budget, and uh, 
And the latest is that the governor has proposed cutting summer lunch for next summer. That's, for, what, that's what I'd heard. As far as the library's part. Yeah. You know, the meals come from federal funds, as sure. I understand it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. The, uh, our new pre-recorded story times that have been posted on social media, Facebook, and YouTube specifically continue to be very well received. I don't have numbers for you tonight, but I intend at the next meeting to give you a, a quarterly report that will include those statistics as well as, as well as other statistics. As mentioned during last month's meeting, the library received a $5,000 grant from the State Library for the purchase of e-content, all of which enhanced the Cloud Library Collection, as, as it's called. And as part of that transaction, the library, we are now officially joined with the what's called the CloudLink California Group of Libraries. So we're one of 38 libraries where we cooperatively share our, our e-book collections. So that, what that means is our, now our patrons have access to about 180,000 items instead of the uh, about 15,000 or so, which is our e-collection. So that is an enhancement that we're excited about. That's a big deal. That's a huge increase in... Yeah, it is. I'm going to do a press release about that too, but just haven't gotten to that one yet. <laughs> <clears throat> Also, as mentioned during the last board meeting, the news service and access for our patrons to over 800,000 items through the vendor partner named Hoopla mm -hmm. went live the last week of May. You all received notification about that. And we will be tracking its usage closely and including those stats in future reports. Did you I ever... appreciate that only because I know I've been following a lot of what LA County Library has been doing. And LA County Library has expanded their Hoopla services. And so I appreciate us as a private city library keeping competition with the LA County to yeah. stay relevant. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. that investment. Good, good. All right, next, my next item. Back in January, working with, with Eric, the library started a project of getting the Techmobile vehicle wrap repaired or replaced. That led to a bidding process, which led to a vendor in Lancaster called Rocket Designs to win the bid and to start the process. During the design phase, seeking input from library staff members and going back and forth with the vendor, the designer, the name Nomobile was decided upon. And as you have now seen in your email from the pictures that I sent earlier today, the new vehicle wrap project is complete. We got the uh, Nomobile back yesterday. We we're pleased with it and excited to show it off at future outreach events. I think it'd be great to drive the mobile in uh, future parades. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The serving with a purpose. See that thing coming too, I'm sorry. Right? With the new wrap. <laughs> you can see that thing coming down the road. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. It, it, and it's really intended as, as a hook uh -huh. to get people to wonder about the library and, uh -huh. uh, so, and not ask questions. Uh -huh. The, uh, when it was named the Techmobile, Ricardo, he usually takes it out. He's the one that takes it out. He was always getting questions about, so do you work on cell phones? Uh, you know, like he was part of the geek squad from mm -hmm. Best Buy. The Serving with a Purpose Conference, which some of you are planning to go to, it has not been officially canceled. However, I expect that it will not be happening this year. On that note, for your information, the staff development day that had been planned and scheduled for August 21st, and you all approved that day for us to close, uh, that has now been canceled. We will not hold that this year. And along the same lines, the annual conference of the American Library Association that was to convene in Chicago at the end of June, in which I would, was planning to attend, was canceled back in March. And the California Library Association annual conference that was to convene in Pasadena in October has been moved to spring of 2021. Okay, so that was going to be my question. Are they planning on doing anything online, like a Zoom conference, or it's completely it just the date is moved? For ALA, the, the big national association, they're, they're doing virtual okay. trainings, which is good. But I confess that I'm getting kind of Zoom meeting out. So. Well, yeah, and that's, I don't know if you want to speak on, I know that, 
through district meetings, you've probably experienced the same. Um, yeah. A big part of going to conferences is being able to network with people. Yeah. And hear firsthand people's experiences, and that's not always possible through a Zoom conference. You can get the yeah. firsthand information and the the knowledge, but you don't always get the the in person conversations. Yeah, and even with that, I mean the the conference or the the meeting that I was in on, not everybody shares their video, so you don't even get to see the reactions. So you don't know really where people are coming from when you're trying to do something by consensus. So it's very difficult. There's some to missing achieve. pieces. Yeah. 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 Yep. Agreed. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we're doing a great job. We're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my last bullet, and this is kind of long, and I'm going to go into more detail than I usually share regarding recruitment mm -hmm. of, of staff. And, um, and I'll say up front that, so, so I've, been, uh, I've been doing, I've been working in libraries for about 39 years. I've been a director now. This is my fourth library. And... I, I'm, I'm very open and candid with staff because I, I use an inter interview committee when we hire new people. That one of the most important things that I do and that we do is decide who gets to join the team, <laughs> frankly. And uh, I, I take it very seriously. I put a lot of, I, I put considerable time and effort into the process. And uh, we, ch we try to be as thorough as we can to really get to know the candidates. And, and frankly, if I, I had a great mentor years ago say, I won't go into the details of the story, but uh, he was the president of the college where I worked. And one time I was on an interview committee and we were struggling over some candidates. And he finally said, you know, we don't have to hire the best of the worst. You know, we can start over. And uh, so I share all this just because it, it's very important to me, it's very important to us. <clears throat> Uh, so this story began back in December when Debbie Peterson resigned, <laughs> and then after that, uh, Jamie Lee Beck became the adult or the assistant director about the end of January. That led, so this is a domino effect that's going to lead up to where we're at now. Uh, Jackie Seacamp then became the youth services librarian at the beginning of March. That left a vacancy from Jackie's previous position, which is something we call Library Associate Three Volunteer Coordinator. Very important position for us. So we had that vacancy, and then the Safer at Home order hit. All recruitment was put on hold, which makes sense. Uh, Ellison has said, okay, stop all recruitments until we figure more out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that position remained vacant. Then about the end of April, got approval by Library Systems and Services to move forward with any recruitments. So at that point, we were able to do that. For that position, I... I knew that we'd have some good internal candidates, so we posted it for internal candidates only. That, it was a recruitment process, or competitive process, interview committee was used. That led to uh, Shea Hawken was appointed to that position. Now, Miss Shea has been our story time person for about 10 years. <laughs> she is loved and revered as a story time person. She's done a wonderful job. Uh, Shay spoke with me and said, you know, I just need to change. <laughs> and, and that happens. We're happy to have Shay as a volunteer coordinator. She's excellent at that. She's done that before, too. So that left her position vacant, and that is what we are currently recruiting for. We posted that about three weeks ago, internal and external. This is a full-time library associate, three position, Story time emphasis. This person is the lead person for our story time sessions. Mm -hmm. Very important position. That position, as, as you can appreciate, that is the first introduction for so many children to reading, to literacy, to the library, oh. and many times to the parents themselves. Because yeah. a lot of parents, it's a modeling of they the don't person. know how to teach sure. literacy. So, with that in mind, uh, I don't mind telling you that I've been very impressed with the applications that we got. Uh, last week, I'm using a committee for this process. We, we, uh, <clears throat> we interviewed eight people by phone over two days. That led to uh, four finalists who have now been invited to an on-site interview uh, Thursday of this week. So we are looking to fill that position hopefully soon. 
but encouraged by, again, by the uh, strength of the applicant pool that we received. So again, that's a, more information I usually share, but that's where we're at. And I can tell you that some of the questions on Thursday will include, so uh, what do you think about virtual story time? <laughs> Because that is part of the new... I think that would be absolutely fabulous. I know that um, at the beginning of the, the lockdown, I what I did is I videoed myself reading some of my grandson's favorite books, and my daughter-in-law said that he just absolutely loved it. So I'm yeah. thinking something like that would be really cool. And you can even get people, you know, guest readers and have it where it's, you know, you can mm -hmm. just play it. So that yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So that'll be. I have a question yeah, about the digital story time. What platform are you guys using to display it? Are you just recording it and putting it on YouTube? Uh, yes. We, we do promote it on Facebook, but, but it's actually loaded on YouTube. I know that there are issues with, um, of course, confidentiality and um, security, but what would it look like to have interactive story time through a platform like Zoom or Google Meet where people could tune in and you could have a meeting code, but that way kids could respond during story time much in the way that they would um, during a real story time. I know there's so many ins and outs to consider. Um, I think that's something that is a benefit. I've been to the story times as a parent myself, um, to the, you know, the parents and me story time, and a beautiful part of it is the interaction piece, not just hearing someone else reading, not just hearing a story time, but getting to wave the materials, getting yeah. to speak back to Miss Maria, getting to, you know, getting to hear it and speak back to the story and chant and be with other children around. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how we can replicate that in a way that's safe, but also fiscally sound. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize, too, safety, because I think Big in a Zoom meeting, kids. you can have some terrible things happen. For sure. That are not real great, so. Absolutely, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to, um, I wouldn't want to, put our children at risk, right. but also provide our kids with an opportunity to be interactive. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the, the comments and suggestions. And on that note, um, having learned of some of the Zoom bombs that have happened with meetings, mm -hmm. uh, our city IT department provided some training and I took advantage of that. And I, I've learned now the security measures that can be put in place so that, that can be avoided, like the things that you mentioned requiring registration, make, making folks wait until they're actually in, allowed into the meeting, things like that. So we are better prepared to do something like that. The um, I've not gone in that direction yet for a couple of reasons, but it's definitely something that I, is on my radar screen for the future. Um, for, um, for a registrate for a registered type story time that could be more interactive. Mm -hmm. And a lot is going to depend on on who we hire. <laughs> sure. yeah, but that's going to be one of the questions. Is uh, Yeah, and I don't think it's something we need to rush into necessarily because every decision we make needs to have a lot of consideration. But just in the interest of um, moving forward, things are going to look different. We, I think um, personally I'm looking at the idea of like the new normal. What does our new normal look like? Yeah. And it doesn't always look like how it looked like. Um, but not losing that human touch. Right. Not losing that interactive piece um, and how we can make that happen. I've seen other libraries online um, with their library directors and their children's library directors um, maintain that contact because I think our children's library um, readers have a huge connection to our community. Um, those kids look forward to those readers. They look uh, forward to those days where they can uh, connect with those readers. Mm -hmm. It's a really important structure in their life. And I would hate for... Mm -hmm. I would hate for our children to miss that and only see it through a screen. Um, if even we're considering, like, in the future story time where we have mandated social distancing for, you know, hey, every every family that comes in sits at a designated spot, like in kindergarten, where you have a spot on a carpet, yep. where we can still make those things happen, but within within reason. Or even have them in... And when we don't have any wind, even outside. I mean, yeah, or options. they reserve it online where we have yeah. 10 families per story time. I mean, I know at the gym, um, for example, with classes at the gym, they do, you have to reserve it. If you want to do a spin class or you want to do a Zumba class, you have to reserve it in advance. Mm -hmm. When you check into the library, you say, hey, I'm here for the 430 spin class, and they give you a little ticket. Yeah. Um, but just maintaining that human connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and it, it's not unheard of. I don't think we were doing it here, um, but other libraries that are directed, even pre-COVID-19, mm -hmm. was so popular that we had to require pre-registration. So, yeah. But yeah, we're, we're starting, I, I've definitely been thinking about ways that we can practice social distancing in person when we're allowed to have some kind of a gathering. Yeah. And then uh, the, the Zoom meeting approach is definitely uh, on my radar screen. I appreciate the library taking any any um, foot forward and continuing the services. Just just thoughts to consider. Out Thank of you. curiosity, do you guys have access to like a, a sound setup, uh, like the kind you can wheel around? Do you guys have access to that in the city? Uh, a portable PA system? Yeah. Yeah, we we, we have one in the library that. Okay. So. That the friend. That oh, was do you mean our, our karaoke system that we just got with our grandmas? <laughs> Yeah, we, we have that too. Uh, <laughs> we have the karaoke system, and the first thing I requested from the friends when I came here was was a, a mobile PA system. Awesome. And uh, and then through uh, PCF, we got some other equipment that we haven't had, like wireless mics and things like that. Well, mm -hmm. that gives you the opportunity to be outside too, if you so yeah. choose. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's the end of my report. So any any other questions or comments? Trustee Hinken, do you have any comments? I uh, just thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive report, Robert. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for listening. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll move on to item number 10 on our agenda, discussion regarding library fines and fees. Uh, do we have any new information or data, or are we still kind of holding off on that until... Yeah, and, and actually the question has come up whether we should leave it on the agenda. I thought that we should, just so it's still there. I think for public transparency, and feel free to correct me, we want to make it known to the public that we are considering the situation, but yes. that everyone's on hold for fees and fines until COVID is yeah, kind of into a new phase. And we need the data to make that decision anyway. Because I know I remember that you had asked for some. I think pretty much everybody's asked for different things as far as data. Yeah. Um, I know that it's been, you know, there's, there's a concern of, about responsibility that was mentioned by one of our, our board members. And I, and I kind of understand that, so mm -hmm. I think it needs to be a pretty thorough discussion. Absolutely. Should, and yeah. I think we need a full board to discuss that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just for transparency, we will, if with everyone's agreeing, um, hold on to item number 10, discussion regarding library fines and fees. We'll continue to add it to the agenda. If I mean, everything is changing week by week. If the county opens up a little more and we decide to have an, um, a discussion about that, we have more data about that, we'll continue that. But if not, we'll continue to just add it to our agenda until we're ready to have that discussion. But as mentioned, having the breakdown of the fines and fees, what went to what, is I think essential for us to have. Mm -hmm. And who it's affecting. Yeah. Do any yeah. board members have any commentary on that? Trustee Hankin, Trustee Manning? No, I'm fine. No, I, I, I would support putting it off for a while. Okay. So we're not, we're not neglecting it. We are going to continue to keep it a priority for when the time is right. Um, this, Item number 11, staff comments? I actually do. I apologize. Uh, if we could go back to number 8. I did not hear who moved and who seconded the motion for that. Oh, thank you. So let's um, formalize the discussion of item number 8, resolution 2020-07, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees to approve and adopt the budget for 2021. Is there a motion to approve that budget? I'll second it. Thank you. That was... Deborah said, I didn't hear who said the motion. Deborah, did you do yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you. Deborah thank motioned you so and Trustee Manning seconded. Second. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. And roll call vote. So that'd be Trustee Manning? Yep. Aye. 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 Thank you. Trustee um, Ratowski Hines? Aye. Trustee Hankin? Aye. Thank you. And Trustee David? Aye. And the motion carries four to four. Thank you for coming back to that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, item number 11 staff comments? No comments for me. All right. Um, I did have a quick question for the staff. I know in the past we had discussed summer reading program in the conjunction with the city um, regarding incentives. Is there, I know, I don't even know actually whether things like Dry Town are going to be open this year. I'm supposing not, but I don't know if there's any incentives from the city for a city um, summer reading program. At this time, all, all, all Dry Town operations are on hold. Um, okay. We are planning to open at some point. Um, unfortunately, this year Dry Town will not be able to to support the, the library's um, efforts in that 
for the main reason is dry, if Dry Town does open, the the capacity and the amount of people allowed into that park will be you know severely limited. So the tickets will have to be held um, for those purposes. Sure. So. Well, I think pie in the face is a great replacement. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to clarify that for constituents. Thank you. Um, trustee comments. Anything from Trustee Hankin? No, nothing here. Trustee Rutowski Hines? I'd just like to, you know, kind of just repeat kind of what I said about how our library, I, all the stuff that's coming at us during COVID that you're, you guys are all doing, I mean, it's really commendable that you guys have not slowed down or stopped and are filling needs that we didn't even know we had. You know what I mean? You're, you're finding those needs and finding ways to fill it. And so thank you for that. I just wanted to repeat that. Do you mind if I respond to that? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would give... Um, obviously credit to the library staff, but I just want to make sure that the credit is also given to our city manager, J.J. Murphy. He is 100% committed to making sure that the services, whatever those services look like, are provided to our residents. And he is gung-ho on making sure that as soon as we're ready to get open, we have the funding available and we're, we're prepared. So J.J. Murphy is definitely gets a lot of that credit we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him and supporting with the council support as well making sure that we have what we need to do our job so I wanted to make thanks, sure to a big thanks to him because it's really obvious absolutely the difference between this city and a lot of other cities Correct. it's very apparent um, how much is going on in the city right. for its residents and to adjust to the new normal and like you guys are really be you've been ahead of the curve really right and for always. As an example, for our Parks and Recreation programs and services, while some of them have been canceled, um, a lot of them have been postponed, and a lot of other cities are pulling that funding back, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our city is keeping the funding there with the hope that at some point places like Dry Town can open this summer. Mm -hmm. So, And I would be in agreement with that. I don't know if I want to encourage the board to maybe reach out to J.J. Murphy and just... Um, Thank, thank our city workers for prioritizing our community. I definitely, I, I know I've spoken recently with um, Mayor Hoffbauer about our city's priorities. Yeah. And I definitely feel that during this crisis, like instead of our budget being the forefront, I definitely feel that the Antelope Valley is specifically Palmdale in contrast to Lancaster has been prioritizing the services for our constituents. Yes, I agree. And I deeply appreciate that because uh -huh. that's usually in a crisis, the first, pe the first people to take a hit. Yeah. 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 And coming from an educational standpoint. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yeah. I, it's very, yeah. A lot of appreciation goes out for that. Absolutely, especially with our summer lunch com, um, program continuing. Yes. That, is, that is deeply important to me as an educator and as a mm -hmm. public servant, and, and I, I cannot express enough thanks for that. Trustee yeah. um, Manning, do you have any comments? No. Okay. I did have comments. <laughs> I always have comments. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, make a comment about... Um, the racial tensions going on in our um, in our society right now. Um, I wanted to formally, on the record, say I support Black Lives Matter because we have 20% of our um, our demographic area um, being Black African American, and we have constituents that are Black. And I think that as as public servants who are not Black, we need to acknowledge the fact that the way we walk into society is not the same as people who are Black or African American, and the kind of privilege that we hold walking into any kind of public space. And, and holding the kinds of privilege that we have to interact with people who are um, city servants or interact with any kind of service. Um, personally, as, um, as an educator, I haven't always held, I'll be honest and say I haven't always had these types of um, approaches. I've definitely been in a place where I haven't been open to my privilege or I've been in denial of it. And over the last decade or so, I've definitely dug into the way that my lens and my way of living is different than my colleagues or different than my friends or different than um, the people that I serve in the public. And I want to be aware of that because to be a servant, you really need to be aware of all, of all perspectives. I want to encourage the library, um, not just the board, but, um, but everyone who's on staff to encourage to dig into their own anti-racism work. Um, there's there's a saying out there that says it's not enough to be not racist, you have to be anti-racist, which is an, an event of action, an event of digging into your own personal place of privilege and, and saying there are things that I live my life in that not everyone else has to consider. And I've definitely dug into my own privilege and, and acknowledged the fact that 
Um, some of the things that I take for granted, not everyone does in our community. We have 20% of our community who's black and African American. And I think about when our, when our constituents walk into our library, do they feel welcomed? And I know that our, and I, I don't say that as an attack. I say that as just a consideration because these are considerations we don't take into consideration as a person with white privilege. Um, do it, does everyone feel welcome? Does everyone feel represented? Even not only in our, our library, um, the, the books that we have on staff, you know, or the, but do we, do people feel welcome with, or do they feel represented in our staffing? Um, do they feel acknowledged? Do they feel targeted? And I think those are things that we can't overlook. And I want to encourage everyone to, to find a way to find their own course of action, whether that is um, in private conversation with families and friends and colleagues, or whether that is through your own private work, through reading and discussion. Um, but I know personally there are a lot of books out there um, that I've been discussing with um, friends, colleagues, even at the district level. I've been reaching out to the city council. Um, I've been in discussion with um, Mayor Hoffbauer about ways that as public servants, we can acknowledge and not be in denial of the fact that we hold privilege as non-people of color or white presenting people. And to, um, to even use our library as a segue because there's many, many people right now in our community who are looking to do their own anti-racism work. Um, for example, books like White Fragility and um, How to Be Anti-Racist, they're sold out on Facebook. They're sold out on, on, in, um, on uh, Amazon. Those books are on hold. And I think as people who are encouraging free dialogue and open dialogue, I'm wondering what the library stance is on providing resources like that so that people in our community who can't afford to buy those resources but are interested in doing that work can access those resources unlimited and have unlimited um, checkouts for those types of um, anti-racist resources. Um, having maybe even displays where in our front little library section where we have a little train where we, you know, have like, oh, it's Black History Month. Let's put books about, you know, black historians on, on uh, display. How can we do that for, um, there's a lot of parents who are looking for resources about how do I teach my kids about how to be anti-racist, not just kind, because being kind is not equal to being anti-racist. How are we putting that on the spotlight? Because silence is violence. And if we don't take a public stand on saying we acknowledge that these things are statistically true and these things are issues that are affect our community, um, I feel like if we're, if we're looking at our library mission and that we are a library that's for everyone, then we need to really stand by that, not only with our words, but with our actions. And our actions can be proof of that by saying we're putting books available for the public. We're putting um, resources available to the public so they can dig into their own work. We're gonna highlight events where we highlight um, organizations that highlight black voices um, to speak on issues that are important to our community. We're going to hold space. I know. I know the library does an amazing job of that already. We we just had uh, the cha the former vice chancellor of UCLA speaking on Martin Luther King. Um, we had our we had our essay um, contest. But I really want to, um, as an educator, I want to suggest the idea that Black History Month is not just February. It's lifelong work, and we've we've lived in a society where for 400 plus years, um, real history has been neglected. And, and I want to bring light to that. That's my personal stance. Um, I want to bring light to that. I really, I'm going to continue to advocate for that. That's one of my personal um, action goals is to make sure that we have those resources available. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to acknowledge the fact that we might be complicit in a system um, that harms other people. And it may not be by default. It may not be by, by intention. But we absolutely need to acknowledge it and work to make sure that all people feel welcome because people who have suppressed and um, oppressed voices don't always feel comfortable to express that. And um, I just want to make sure that our library is acknowledging that during this time. That's, I know we don't speak on comments, but that's, that's my comment for tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments? Trustee Hankin? I will take that as a no. Um, <laughs> um, with that being said, um, if there's no other comments, I will call the meeting to end at 7.01 p.m. And we'll adjourn and we'll meet next month, hopefully all in person. I, I did have a question. Are we going to be inviting the public to, former, to future meetings or are we still going to be online? It uh, depends on the county order. Okay. Everything's up in the air. Yeah. Okay.